Now it is time for focus. We head today to Belgium. Proportionally, proportionately rather to the size of its population, it is the European country with the highest number of citizens leaving for Iraq and Syria to fight jihad. The fear of new terrorist attacks like the one last May against the Jewish uh, Museum in Brussels has convinced authorities to opt for a tough approach, especially when dealing with jihadists who decided to come home. Some, though, argue that this entirely coercive approach is not enough and that prevention, dialogue and, hopefully, de-radicalisation should also be on the agenda. A number of initiatives within Belgian civil society are seeking to promote this approach, while authorities, although discreetly, seem now uh, to be showing increasing support for such projects, as Catalina Landabru and her team have been finding out. In Belgium, he's become the darling of the media. An Islamic scholar of Palestinian origin, this young scientist travelled to Syria, where he risked his life by joining the jihad. Upon returning, he decided to use his experience for the good and open a de-radicalisation centre. The aim? To prevent further departures to Syria and reintegrate Belgian fighters when back home. His method? Listen and talk. No judgement or trial. Is that why they are going to Syria? The reason why people leave is oppression. Oppression by uh, authorities and government. And so people are getting the feeling that they are not welcome here anymore. If they not change the way uh, the governments like you to be. Upon return to Belgium, Yunus was arrested and sentenced to three years probation. Here the idea is to help with his reintegration and broaden his horizons. Here he can uh, talk to me. He can, uh, yeah, he can canalize his uh, emotions, his frustrations. He can uh, share his story. And I am just listening. To be honest, I more regret that I am here back than I, than I left. Because I thought I came back and it will be a little bit different or uh, everything will be cooled down, but it's worse. I don't want to be de-radicalized because I'm not radical. I find myself orthodox and I find myself fundamental. It's not that, that I'm going to change because they are suppressing me. It feeds it. It, it, it makes it stronger. Meanwhile, lawyer and co-founder of the centre, Nabil Rifi, offers legal advice to young people like Younes, those under permanent supervision by intelligence services. For fear of new attacks, the Belgian authorities have adopted a repressive stance, a method that doesn't help these two men. These people need to be able to talk to someone. They need psychological support. But all this is not provided by the government. That is why we decided to do something about this problem. We also want to help parents, help them learn how to take care of their children and how they can help with the de-radicalization of their children. Often considered accomplices as opposed to victims, parents of jihadists sometimes come here to talk, afraid to turn to the police. Initially, I had warned the authorities that my son was about to leave for Syria and they told me they would follow up on it, but nothing was done. Their explanation was, Mazam, your son was an adult. We parents were really stigmatized by the police, as if we had bought our tickets for Syria too. <laughs> to show the horror of jihadism to the public, break the silence and the isolation of families, another initiative has arrived in Belgium. This play Jihad is a tragic comedy about three Belgian fighters in Syria. It takes a satirical look using cliches and taboos with the aim of making people laugh. <laughs> Before we even began the play, some thought this was going to insult Islam. Others thought it would be an apology of terrorism. But the first spectators arrived, they started laughing. The comedy kicks in pretty early in the play. That was a shock for many. These guys are crazy. They're laughing about these topics. And in the end, it worked. Laughter is a unifying power. It brings everyone together. In Belgium, 30,000 people have already attended the play, including many school children. Its success has earned the play a name in the field of preventing radicalization. The show has also been exported to France. It's been performed in Arras and is also programmed for Nîmes, and then the capital, Paris.
That report from our team of correspondents in Brussels. Well, for more on the story, we can speak now to Abdella Siem El Difraoui, who joins us uh, from Vienna, who's a researcher here at Sciences Po. Thank you very much, Mr. El Difraoui, for being uh, with us. Now, uh, we heard in that report, of course, uh, other approaches to dealing with the problem. The point is that for now, and many different European countries are faced with this problem of departing jihadis and returning jihadis, uh, with uh, the West involved in this war, it cannot be neutral and therefore will always err on on the side of taking a tough stance? Um, yeah, there's a tough stance to take um, on um, the war and on Daesh in, um, in Syria and Iraq, obviously. The question is what to do with people who return, who return um, partly disenchanted with jihad, with what they saw there, and um, with other people who return um, who are fully convinced jihadis and ready to, to com uh, commit attacks in Europe. So the first step, um, relating to de-radicalization and to returning to jihadis is to evaluate um, which kind of people these returnees are. Did they fight? Um, did they go there to fight against the um, murderous Assad regime, but are not fully fledged jihadis, or are there people who returned um, simply to commit attacks? Now, uh, you mentioned the disenchantment with what they found on the fronts of the Islamic State organization uh, from the jihadis who returned. The problem is that many of them were disenchanted uh, with the societies they'd left, and that's not something that's easily addressed. No, that's something which is not easily addressed at all. Um, any kind of de-radicalization um, is a very complex approach. It's in some ways reconciling people with Western societies, explaining them that they can fully lift their face here, and it's offering those people perspectives. De-radicalization doesn't mean to simply reverse the process of radicalization, but it means really um, giving those young people perspectives, um, reintegrating them in society, and really changing them as well. Do, do, you, do you believe that once uh, a, a young man or woman has taken the very bold step of getting themselves on a plane, going out to Syria, once they've gone down that, that far down that route, do you really think uh, that talking to them is enough to bring them back, to reconcile them with the idea of the societies that they've left? It's, um, it's not only talking to them. I mean, de-radicalization means really um, giving them some psychological help, um, giving some, them some spiritual help, giving them help in their daily life to reintegrate schools, um, to find a job, um, um, help their families. And there have been examples of people um, who have been coming back, numerous examples, who have been reintegrated into Western society. So it works. Anyway, there's no alternative to at least trying de-radicalization, because we can't lock these people away forever. Some of them have not committed crimes. So um, every European country really needs to work on de-radicalization and on prevention, because there's simply no alternative. Of course, part of the problem uh, are resources. Uh, the, the, the approach that you mentioned, of course, has to work in uh, connection, uh, in tandem with uh, surveillance, because, of course, some of them do have to be watched because their intentions uh, are, are, are to cause uh, trouble on their return rather than to reintegrate. And the problem is the European uh, societies are finding they simply don't have the resources even to do that. They're trying to find those resources at this stage. And not everybody needs to be surveilled. And there are many civil society in initiatives um, in Europe, including Great Britain, where um, accredited mentors follow those people. And these accredited mentors um, are people who will not provide personal information to the security services, but clearly um, provide security-related information if there's in danger and address, um, address the security services. So it's very important to have somehow neut neutral intermediaries, um, which on the one hand can explain to um, jihadis who return that um, they're really helping them and wish to help them um, to reintegrate into society. Um, and will protect them to a certain degree from um, very repressive um, security apparatus. Um, but at the same time, explain also that if any kind of security concern comes up, they will clearly indicate this to the, um, to the services. Uh, finally, there's been a lot of attention paid to attempts to prevent the problem at source, that rather than trying to deal with them when they return, trying even to stop young jihadis from leaving uh, European uh, countries. It's a remarkably ambitious thing to want to do. I mean, can it be done, actually, with the resources that countries like France and Belgium and Britain have? Let's, let's um, put it this way. Not every jihadi can be de-radicalized. Not every jihadi can be prevented from leaving. But um, if 
we prevent some of them leaving, we might save a lot of lives already. And there have been exact, um, um, successful examples of, um, of um, jihadis being prevented from leaving. I personally met uh, people um, who risked to become jihadis in southern France and who, through psychological following and through counsel, have been prevented from leaving France. Abdelassiem El Difraoui, thank you very much indeed for having been our guest. It is